Hey guys, SGT here, and I couldn't be more enthusiastic about having on the phone right now one of my favorite people on the planet, James Turk, the founder of Gold Money. Gold Money is a place where folks can buy physical precious metals and have them securely stored in the vaults of Gold Money in different vault locations around the planet. James Turk is also the co-author of the book, The Coming Collapse of the Dollar. Mr. Turk, such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Sean. It's a pleasure to be with you. We are seeing so much volatility in the gold and silver space, but for those of us that have been trying to um, accumulate these metals for any period of time, we're kind of getting used to this. I know that you've noted that this summer you're expecting a nice run-up in gold. So where do you think we're headed? Well, you know, let's step back and take a look at the at the long-term uh, point of view. Um, I'm sticking with my long-term forecast that sometime between 2013 and 2015, gold will be about $8,000 an ounce and silver will be about $400 an ounce. And the ratio between the two metals will be 20 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. And I made this forecast back in October 2003, uh, obviously when the price of both gold and silver was much, much lower. But the point I'm making is that we're in a financial bust. And during a, a financial bust like the one we've been in for several years, and we still have a few more years to go, people move out of financial assets and they move into tangible, ass tangible assets because they're looking for a safe haven. Uh, they want to avoid counterparty risk. And the safest of all havens are the precious metals because they're a tangible asset with no counterparty risk. So, you know, from a long-term point of view, I think we're still heading, you know, much, much higher. And you mentioned, you know, the way I approach the markets, which is to continue accumulating. You know, don't view gold to be an investment. It really isn't an investment because it doesn't generate cash flow. It's really money. And when you accumulate gold this way, you're actually saving money. And saving money is a good thing. At some point in time in the future, we're going to take these savings and either uh, invest them or we're going to spend them or, you know, just continue to hold them. But at some point in time in the future, uh, gold's value will be at a maximum and uh, you'll want to uh, take advantage of everything that you're saving, saving now through, the, through the, uh, these relatively difficult economic and financial times. With regard to the short term, uh, yeah, I, I am looking for a pop. Uh, up in the gold price this summer, and it relates back to what happened in December. Uh, excuse me, in the summer of 1982, when the Mexican government defaulted on its debt, and it sent gold up 50% in three months, and a double in uh, uh, six months, a, a double in the gold price. The circumstances today are very similar. The, go the, the government ready to default, uh, to default though is not Mexico; it's Greece. Uh, Portugal, Ireland, uh, maybe even Italy, who knows. But, you know, there are any number of countries that could be defaulting on their debt. And when that happens, I think that could really light a fire out of the gold price. So that's why I was making some comments about uh, be prepared for an upside jump in the gold price this summer. Absolutely. When you made that forecast of $8,000 gold between 2013 and 2015 and 2003, Gold was trading around $350 an ounce, and silver uh, at that time was probably around 4 or $5 an ounce. You've been right a very, very long time, and it's your track record. And frankly, it's the way you speak with such uh, sincerity and grace that I think makes people, the common man, the, the folks that, uh, that I kind of represent, your message really resonates with us because we, we view you as a very trustworthy person and a trustworthy source of information. Now, let me ask you this. What do you see as Before you go on, let me just say... Before you go on, let me just say thank you for those comments. I sincerely appreciate it. Let me just add one thing because, you know, gold was $350 in uh, October, in uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 2003, you know, when I made those forecasts. But I want to explain that there's no myth or magic to these forecasts. It's really mathematics. And to explain this point, $350 in October 2003, uh, when I was interviewed in Barron's where I made that forecast, was approximately equal to $35 in 1971, allowing for inflation over the intervening 32 years right. of, uh, of time. Right. So if gold can go from $35 to $800 in the 1970s, which it did, I was basically saying that history compete, will repeat on an inflation-adjusted basis, taking gold from $350 to $8,000. So, you know, gold really is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Um, and, you know, that's the way I think people really should look at it. You know, it's a form of liquidity. Uh, it's a way to protect your purchasing power. At some times you want to own a lot of it. At other times you want to own less of it. 
But, you know, gold is still undervalued and you want to continue accumulating it and ignore the volatility that we're seeing in these markets. You know, on the day of the month that you're supposed to be buying and saving money, you know, go ahead and do it and wait until next month. Over time, a dollar cost average approach like this is going to work very well for you. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question then on that, because I think when we talk about uh, $400 an ounce silver and $8,000 gold, you're probably using the same uh, statistics uh, of accounting that John Williams would use. And so my follow-up question is, beyond that, do you consider the massive amount of paper, silver, and gold in the marketplace when you calculate how much even higher than that the prices of these metals could possibly go when the paper fraud unwinds? Yeah, you know, I do in the back of my mind. The the problem with the paper part of the market is that we really just cannot um, determine accurately how much paper is out there. And, you know, there have been estimates. I've always thought it was about 20 times more paper than, than actual physical metal. But, you know, at the CFTC hearings uh, over a year ago, you know, it came out that there's 100 times more paper than there was actual metal. That's right. But, you know, here's the point, John. Even if there's two times more paper than there is metal, somebody's going to be disappointed at the end of the day if they're holding paper instead of the real thing. Absolutely. Because during the financial crisis, you know, there are defaults, you know, and uh, people uh, break promises. Governments break promises. Uh, banks break promises. And it's this kind of promise breaking that occurs during a financial bust uh, that makes gold and silver so attractive. Physical gold and silver, though, not their paper representatives or paper substitutes. Absolutely. And I just want to weigh in here for the audience that when, when we talk about sound money and when you say that gold and silver in the physical form have no counterparty risk, that does mean that there are no promises on that, on that metal. When you own it, you own it and nobody else can, uh, can leverage that away from you or steal it through a, you know, a broken paper promise. You know, I get a lot of PMs, uh, James, from folks saying, you know, where do I keep it? Do I, do I really just buy a safe and, and bolt it to my basement? Or, you know, what do you recommend here? And I think at the end of the day, um, certainly I recommend that, you know, uh, to some degree uh, for somebody who would like to have some on hand for a worst case scenario. But gold money is really an excellent way to go because it's in your secure vaults. It's audited. It's really there. And um, I, I think people need to know about gold money. Should we just talk briefly about that before we move on to my other questions? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background, though, because, you know, you, hit, you again, you hit the nail on the head in terms of dealing with physical metal. You know, when you're buying physical gold or buying physical silver, there are really only two ways to do it. You buy it and you store it yourself, or you buy it and you have someone store it for you, which is what we do in gold money. Now, each alternative has different advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, if you buy it and store it yourself, you, you have it at hand, but the disadvantages are that you, uh, you know, uh, may not be able to get insurance for it. You know, there's the risk of theft. Um, and there's also the illiquidity. You know, if you need that gold or you need that silver, you end up having to take it down to the shop uh, and, you know, pay various fees, et cetera, uh, to convert it back into a national currency. In gold money, the disadvantage is that you don't have it in hand, but the advantages are that you have instantaneous liquidity in that you can sell it and get the spot price of the, the, uh, the metal in any of six uh, major currencies and have that wired to your bank account. Uh, anywhere in the world. Um, now, the, the key risk that people are taking when they have uh, gold stored for them by others is you really want to know that the gold and silver are really there. And so what we do in gold money is we have regular audits uh, by two different firms, uh, you know, confirming, among other things, that the weight of gold and silver in the vaults is exactly equal to the quantity of uh, gold and silver owned by our customers. And these audits are available to our customers. We've been doing this now for 10 years and we're storing over $2 billion of uh, customer assets. The other advantage of gold money is that you can store your gold in vaults that are located in London, Zurich, or Hong Kong. So you've got good political, geographic, uh, political and geographic diversification which, again, is a way of mitigating your risks when owning physical precious metals, you know, the risk of confiscation by any one government. Hey, I wanted to ask you this. Um, which part of the world do you see at greatest risk right now for a default? The European Union, the United States, or Japan? Uh, you left out the U.K. <laughs> or the U.K. Uh, they're, right up there with the, <laughs> they're right up there with the others. You know, it's uh, which horse in the glue factory is the best looking, you know? They're, they're all pretty bad. 
Um, and it's really hard to predict which one's going to go first. But, you know, clearly Greece is the, uh, the, the sovereign risk uh, uh, at the moment that's perhaps the one that is um, worthy of getting the most attention. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their financial condition is just terrific. Uh, the government is trying to shove down the throats of the Greek population, uh, measures that are unbelievably unpopular. Uh, you know, the government has just really screwed it up. The banks that continued lending to Greeks uh, really screwed it up as well. Uh, so that's where we should really be focusing our attention. And the European Union has just been making, you know, one bad decision after another mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, trying to, you know, uh, bail out these these various debtors. And it's it's similar to the United States in the sense that, you know, why should taxpayers in, um, let's say, West Virginia bail out uh, California if California defaults on its debt? Right. Uh, you know, well, people in Germany. Uh, bail out Greece if Greece defaults in its debt. Um, you know, there's no logical reason why that happens. Um, the only reason why these bailouts are occurring is because the banks have control of the politicians, and the banks don't want to take the loss, so they're putting the losses on the shoulders of the taxpayer. But that's killing the economy, uh, and the taxpayers have had enough. You know, in Spain, for example, the unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate is 21%. The unofficial unemployment rate is over 30%, and the youth unemployment rate officially is 40%. Uh, I mean, we have depression conditions in a lot of places in Europe. You know, Greece is as bad as as Spain in terms of its economic conditions. And the politicians refuse to accept reality, although it's changing. There was a big election in Greece this past week, excuse me, in Spain this past weekend, where the ruling party at the local level uh, had a huge loss. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some changes coming at the political level. The same thing has happened in Germany. But uh, I don't know what it's going to take to shake up these politicians, that the, but this road that they're on is clearly the wrong road. And, um, uh, you know, I think the demonstrations and uh, political results that we're seeing in Europe uh, and in other places as well to a certain extent uh, are a reflection of the discontent that's growing worldwide with the present system as it's structured. Well, absolutely. And and the reason I wanted to throw the United States in the mix is, uh, I mean, I understand what's going on in Greece, as do many of our listeners, but on a economic level, aren't the problems in Illinois and California and many other states uh, in the United States, which are in dire straits, even in worse shape? And now that the federal, now that the debt ceiling has been reached on a federal level, what do we make of this? I mean, I think most Americans are in a hypnotic state and they're just not recognizing how bad things are in this country. So when we, when we hear that Greece is ready to default, isn't that many times a smaller economy than California? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not so sure that Americans are in a hypnotic state. I think the politicians are in a hypnotic state um, because they're refusing to rec- recognize the reality that the you know they're running out of money you know one of my favorite quotes from margaret thatcher is is she said the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money (laughs) and that's exactly what we're seeing now this concludes part one click here for part two